Well, thank you for joining us once again. Welcome to Grace. Um, in our lesson today, we want to do as I said earlier, pick it up where we left off in our previous session. And as most of you will recall, Paul was in, while Paul was in, in uh, Troas with his traveling companion, Silas, Silas was the saint of the earthly kingdom promise, uh, Paul had received the call to journey on into the region of Macedonia. Uh, it wasn't long after they had reached Philippi on that second journey that Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. So as you can see there on our map entitled The Four Journeys of Paul, and the one entitled Paul's Second Journey, uh, he received the call in Troas, they went, uh, journeyed on into Macedonia, into Philippi, and that's where Paul and Silas were thrown into prison. And uh, as, as if the pitch black darkness of that room, uh, dug deep within the rocks, had not been sufficiently uh, uh, unsettling to both men, they had their feet placed in stocks, and their hands shackled. And this is, the, for those watching it, this is a photo of the traditional site of Paul and Silas's imprisonment. Uh, whether it's the actual site or not, but this is the site that's been recognized as the site that Paul would have been in prison. Um, the footstocks and the wrist chains, by the way, were, were not only meant to prevent a prisoner's escape, um, but also they were meant to be a form of punishment in those days. Movement rendered nearly impossible. Comfort was out of the question. Um, and for what were those two men being punished, we could ask? Well, they were being punished for their belief and teaching that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Israel had been promised, risen from the dead, um, that he's very much alive, having risen from the dead, and that God has granted to him all authority in heaven and on earth. They did not want to hear that in that day, and you can imagine how unnerving that situation might have been for Paul and Silas being thrown into that prison, a dark cell and uh, no movement permitted. Yet the Bible tells us that at midnight, both Silas, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. Uh, do you think they shared a common hope? That's a question I want you to think about this morning. Did they share a common hope? Because uh, both men now, remember, Silas was a saint of the earthly kingdom promise. You see, in spite of their circumstance of the moment, they shared a common expectation. And that expectation was what the writer of the book to the Hebrews was talking about in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28, where he stated, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. This isn't the great white throne judgment being spoken of here. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Simply meaning deliverance until the context gives us what type of deliverance is being spoken of. Paul was not afraid to die. We know that very well. Both Paul and Silas knew that their hope, their deliverance, was not to be found in this present evil world, but in the second appearing of Jesus Christ. The appearing, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews wrote about some 15 years after the Jerusalem Council had taken place and Paul shared his gospel, after the completion of Paul's three apostolic expeditions. Keep in mind again that Silas was a, a man in a position of high authority at the Jerusalem Council. But he had been sent by the Twelve to accompany Paul, which he did on this, on this second journey. So looking back at our Acts period illustration, and if Unger's dating is correct, then the letter to the Hebrews would have been written sometime after Paul's third journey was completed. Certainly Silas, a saint of the earthly kingdom promise, had come to understand Paul's Gentile apostleship and to believe Paul's message long before that time because Silas had been ministering right along with Paul for the entire time of Paul's second apostolic uh, mission. He had journeyed and taught with Paul. Paul and Silas were both looking for the same appearing of Jesus Christ. And we show that as we move on into Scripture today. If you don't think that Paul and Silas shared the same hope concerning the second appearing of Jesus Christ, consider Paul's introductory words in both of the letters he wrote back to the saints in Thessalonica regarding their hope. First, what was the hope that Paul was writing about? Well, it's in this Thessalonian epistle, first and second. Uh, chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, Paul wrote, For what is our... Now, who's the our there? Who's with him? Silas. What is our, Paul and Silas's hope? 
or joy or crown of rejoicing, there's a judgment after this appearing, are not even ye, ye saints in Thessalonica, in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his what? At his coming. Paul uses both words, coming and appearing, coming and appearing, over and over. Uh, that the confident expectation of Paul and Silas was not only in their steadfast assurance that Jesus Christ would be making a second appearance, that he would come again, but also in the fact that the returning Christ would be bringing back with him all those who had previously died in Christ, according to Paul. And Paul went on to write in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, the same letter, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. You should know some things here, he's saying, concerning them which are asleep, those who had died previously, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus, those believers, will God bring with him? How many? All of them. The question we might ask is this time, at this time is this. Did Silas, a circumcision saint of the earthly kingdom promise, share Paul's hope? The hope that Paul was writing about when he wrote about the appearing of Jesus Christ, who would be bringing back with him all those who had died in Christ. Did Silas have the hope of a, a hope of a different kind, of a separate appearing in mind? I don't believe so. I believe he had the same appearing in mind that Paul speaks about. Uh, the answer to that question, according to the evidence in this letter, is of course, Paul was sharing, or Silas was sharing Paul's hope. Proof of that is sitting in Paul's greetings. In both of the letters, he wrote back to the saints in Thessalonica, to whom he was relaying the good news of this second appearance of Jesus Christ. Notice to whom Paul attributes his letter as he writes to these saints in Thessalonica, at both in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. So he's addressing both letters from some people. Let's take a look. Paul and Silvanus, as we would pronounce it, Silvanus, uh, not the correct pronunciation, but it's actually uh, Siloanus, uh, or Siloanas is actually the correct pronunciation. But he addresses the letter, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalon Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice the address, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. Now notice how Paul included Silvanus in his second letter also. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus under the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The theme in both of Paul's letters back to the saints in Thessalonica is the second appearing of Jesus Christ, who Paul just told us there in that book will be bringing back with him all those who will have died in Christ prior to to that second appearing. These letters regarding the hope that Paul was communicating were being sent to the saints in Thessalonica as we've just seen from whom? Take a look back at those two verses according to the Apostle Paul. You've just read it yourself in both letters from Paul. From Paul, from Silvanus, properly pronounced again Silvanas, and Timotheus. Timotheus is none other than the one called Timothy. And Silvanus is none other than the one called Silas in Scripture, the circumcision saint of the earthly kingdom promise, a chief leader of the circumcision, uh, of the circumcision saints in Jerusalem who the twelve apostles had sent to accompany Paul in order that he might verify Paul's ministry and message. Silas is simply the shortened version of the name Silvanus or Silvanas. They were one and the same person according to dictionaries of the Greek language. Do you suppose that Paul would be writing back to the saints at Thessalonica about the hope of Christ's second appearing and how the hope of Paul and the hope of Silvanus or Silas was their appearance at that second appearance, uh, at that second appearing of Christ. The saints there in Thessalonica and the good news that Christ would be bringing back with him uh, at that appearing, all those who had died in faith, and then address his letters about that hope as coming from himself and Silas and Timothy, unless all three of those men of God had been sharing the common hope that Paul was writing about in those letters. Paul didn't leave Silas out when it came to the hope that he was sharing. He was relaying to the saints in Thessalonica a hope, and he included Silas. We just witnessed that. Paul and Silas were both looking for the same appearing of Jesus Christ. 
The epistle entitled 1 Peter was written during the same time frame as the epistle to the Hebrews. And that would have been after the conclusion of Paul's third apostolic mission. This would have been at least 10 years after the conclusion of his second journey with Silas and some 15 plus years after the imprisonment of Paul and Silas at Philippi. Silas had known Paul's message for many years when this letter from Peter was written to the circumcision saints scattered abroad. Listen to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. That the trial of your faith... Now, Paul had just told the saints in Thessalonica that they were suffering the same things that their, uh, the Jews were suffering of their own countrymen. That the trial of your faith, the faith of the circumcision saints, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory when? At the appearing of Jesus Christ. Because there's a judgment going to take place at that appearing. Uh, not a third appearance of Jesus Christ, but at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And the author of Hebrews, as we said, said he's going to come back the second, not third, fourth, fifth, but second time. Now notice how Peter, chief spokesman of the circumcision saints, included Silas as well in chapter 5, verse 12 of his letter. By, what's the next name there? Silvanus, none other than Silas, who had shared Paul's letter. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose. The word translated suppose means to reckon, or as I take into account. I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God, wherein ye, ye saints of the circumcision, saints of the earthly kingdom promise, stand. So it shouldn't catch us by surprise that both Peter and Paul taught about the deliverance at the coming, at the appearing of Jesus Christ when writing to the saints who had been undergoing that extreme persecution for their faith in the gospel of God. And given Peter's words in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16, it shouldn't catch us by surprise that both Peter and Paul were talking about the same appearing of Jesus Christ. Listen to Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, simply meaning deliverance again, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, you circumcision saints, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So Peter was, in a sense, saying, listen to Paul. Give heed to what Paul's written to you. In how many epistles did Peter say? In all his epistles. Paul didn't come to, to, uh, to take away something and add something different um, and leave something else in place, I should say that. He came to add to those saints. He came to add information. They added nothing to him, but he added to them. And these are things that he added to them. What things had Peter been talking about? Well, here it is in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts. Sound like 2 Timothy chapter 3 to you, where Paul writes about the last days? And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The question was not whether Peter and Paul were sharing the same hope. The second appearing of Jesus Christ and the deliverance of all believers, whether dead or alive, at Christ's second coming. Uh, the deliverance they would realize at his second appearance. It's quite obvious from Scripture that indeed both Peter and Paul were sharing the common hope, as was Silas. The question is not whether Christ would come again, whether or not there would be a second appearing. The question is when would that second appearing of Jesus Christ take place? This is where it gets very interesting. Now, follow me here for a moment as we try to arrive at an answer to that question. From where did Paul write his two letters to the saints at Thessalonica? He wrote them from Corinth, as you can see there on our second journey map once again, as he came all the way down to the left side on your map uh, to Corinth. And uh, that's there on the Four Journeys of Paul illustration entitled Paul's Second Journey. Paul would write two letters in regard to the hope of Christ's second appearance to the saints in Thessalonica. And he would write them during that same time period uh, in which he was teaching the saints in Corinth. Do you suppose that Paul would have anything to say about that second appearance of Jesus Christ to the Corinthian saints? 
I guess he did. He was writing the letters back to Thessalonian, Thessalonian saints from there. We do indeed find that to be the case in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 58. Let's take a quick look. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 and 51. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Remember, the kingdom of God includes both heaven and earth. Everything in heaven is his, everything in earth is his, his is the kingdom, the overall kingdom, as you recall. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. How many, to how many men was Paul to make, to make known the, the, the mystery? He was to make it the fellowship of the mystery known to all men. Now let's back up and take this verse a section at a time. According to the apostle, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption, meaning that which is uh, corruptible, uh, that which is capable of being corrupted, inherit incorruption, that which is incapable of being corrupted. In other words, a great change must take place where those who will inherit the kingdom of God are, are concerned. Who will be inherited in inheriting the kingdom of God according to the Apostle Paul? Well, the answer is those who are his at his appearing. Those who are in Christ, Paul told us in this first Thessalonians epistle. Those who sleep in Jesus, um, who had uh, taken God at his word to them, along with those believers who are alive and remain unto his appearing. In other words, all who are in Christ will undergo this great transformation at Christ's second appearance. We need to understand that the mystery or secret that God had, had not previously made known until Paul revealed it is not that Christ would make a second appearance. That's not part of the mystery. Christ himself revealed that he would come again in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let's go there for a moment. Notice what Christ revealed to his earthly disciples at least a year, maybe more, prior to Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Here it is in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled, he wrote them. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, literally places of abode. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So Christ's second appearance was not part of the mystery. The great transformation was part of the mystery, as we'll see. Now, let's return once again to the 1 Corinthians passage. The mystery was not a second appearing of Jesus Christ. Jesus, as you have just seen, had spoken of that to his disciples during his earthly ministry. The mystery Paul was revealing as a part of that progress, of those progressive revelations that he was, had been receiving was the instantaneous change that he was now making known and that Christ would be bringing back with him all those that had taken God and his word throughout the ages. Here it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery, mysterion in the Greek. It's simply a secret that God had been keeping. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be, next word, changed. Put simply, there will still be believers on this earth when Christ returns. And those believers, along with the believers who will have previously experienced physical death uh, prior to that second appearance, will receive a miraculous transformation. No one else had revealed this component of the mystery until it was revealed to and then through the Apostle Paul. But once again, to how many men was the Apostle Paul to make known the revelation of the mystery? Uh, or the secret that God had not previously revealed, but he would make it known to the circumcision saints by making it known to the twelve apostles as he added to them at the Jerusalem council. He had certainly made it known to Silas, uh, a saint of the earthly kingdom promise who had accompanied Paul on his first visit to Corinth during Paul's second journey. The particular aspect of the mystery that Paul was revealing to the saints at Corinth was the great change the miraculous transformation that would take place at Christ's second appearance where all dead and living believers are concerned. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We, who's the we, ref, who does that refer to here? Uh, to whom would the statements, we shall all be changed, apply? Well, this great transformation will include all those who have taken God at his word, as we said. God's ecclesia, God's outcalling, the church of God, the household of faith that God joined to the person of his son when the sa Savior rose again from the dead. It will include all those who are his at his appearing, according to Paul. 
Now, how will this grand supernatural change take place? We could ask Paul that question. Keep reading with verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. Let's read through the remainder of the passage, verses 54 through 58. First, verses 54 and 56. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Verses 57 and 58. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's a judgment coming at that second appearing. And it's not the great white throne judgment at the second appearing. There is a judgment seat of Christ that will take place at that second appearing. Uh, Paul reminded Timothy in Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 that the Lord Jesus would judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. This judgment will be nothing more than the judgment seat of Christ, as I just said, where all believers will either be rewarded for their work of faith, their labor of love, their patience of hope, or suffer the loss of those rewards, as Paul stated earlier in the same epistle that he sent to the saints in Corinth. This is the same judgment Peter was referring to when he said that the trial of your faith, the same trial the saints in Thessalonica were undergoing, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. But again, the question begs to be answered. When would Christ appearing, the transformation of believers, and the catching up of all believers take place? Paul just told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 52, that it would take place at the last trump. But that in itself doesn't tell us a whole lot, does it? It's, People all over the board try to describe when that last trump will be and what it's all about. Is there anything else in Scripture where we might glean more information as to the timing of the second appearing of Jesus Christ and the catching up of the saints to be with the Lord in the air? Is there anything else we can look at? For the answer to that question, let's move forward to Paul's second letter to the saints in Thessalonica and see if we can discover the problem those saints were having and why Paul had to refresh their minds as to the hope of the saints regarding that appearing of Jesus Christ and their being caught up together with their loved ones who Christ would be bringing back with him. Watch as Paul identifies the problem in Thessalonica in chapter 2 of his second letter, beginning with verse 1. Now we, who was Paul referring to? We, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, those he addressed this letter from, beseech you, Brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Bible scholars make a lot of the fact that the day of Christ is only used a few times and it's really talking about that reunion uh, and the day of the Lord's used more for judgment. But why are they used there almost interchangeably? Well, we'll see. Apparently, at least some if not many of the saints in Thessalonica had begun to worry uh, that the day of the Lord had arrived. It was right at their doorstep. Why would the arrival of the day of Christ cause these saints to be troubled and shaken in mind? Now ponder it for a moment. If by the expression the day of Christ, Paul had been referring to the catching up of the saints, along with their departed loved ones and the reunion to take place, those departed loved ones who were in Christ, that reunion to take place as they meet the Lord in the air, I'd hardly think that would have been troubling to those saints. Why would, his, why would what has come to be called the rapture of the outcalling be something that would rattle their minds, cause them to be troubled in spirit? With the persecution these saints had been experiencing, far more pe persecution than you or I have ever had to undergo, and we're looking forward to the rapture, are we not? Do I see any heads? <laughs> I hear it all the time. I should think they'd be just the opposite of troubled and shaken in mind to be told that the rapture was right at their doorstep. No, it was something else about, uh, about being 
uh, falsely led to believe that the day of Christ was at hand, right around the corner, about to happen, that was troubling the saints at Thessalonica? Was it the fact that they had lost believing family members and friends, perhaps, and that they were worried that those departed loved ones would miss the second appearing of Jesus Christ? Paul did indeed correct that notion by telling them that the dead in Christ would be the first to rise, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But was it only the worry over previously departed loved ones that caused them to be shaken in mind? That may certainly have been a part of their mental distress, but I don't think it was a, a near, nearly all of it. I believe the resolution to the mental anguish they were experiencing lies in Paul's statement in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. I'm sure you're familiar with Paul's words in this passage. For God hath not appointed us unto wrath. Now we know it was troubling them. Wrath was troubling them. But to obtain salvation, deliverance from the wrath to come at the second appearing by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Now think back to the Jewish participants in that assembly in Thessalonica. Those Jews who had previously been steeped in the law of Moses, but had come to believe the gospel Paul presented to them. Keep in mind that Paul had proven through the Old Testament scrolls, their own scrolls, that they had been reading in the synagogues, the law, and more specifically the prophets, that Jesus is the Christ. I should think those Jews to have gained a much higher respect, higher interest and appreciation in the words of the prophets after Paul's visit when he pointed them back to the prophets and pointed to Christ. What would the prophets of the Old Testament scriptures have told those Jews about the wrath to come? To answer that question, let's take a look at some of these very familiar verses from some of the Jewish prophets of old. Uh, I'll begin with Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. We've already noted many of these passages in previous lessons, but uh, now we can see how they would have been particularly troubling to the Jewish saints in Thessalonica who were being told that the day of Christ was right at their doorstep. For instance, Isaiah had warned the people of the nation with these words in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, uh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. And he, the returning Jesus Christ, shall destroy the sinners out of it. Notice Joel chapter 1 now, verse 15, along with Joel chapter 2, verse 1, as the prophet Joel presented some additional troubling words concerning the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 1, verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. In chapter 2, verse 1, Joel went on to say, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land, this is the land over there promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. Then in the same chapter, verse 11, Joel went on to say, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that, ex that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. In other words, dreadfully frightening is the idea. And who can abide it? Isaiah and Joel were not the only prophets to warn of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Amos was another of those Jewish prophets who had warned of that frightening time to come. Notice what Amos had to say about the day of the Lord in Amos chapter 5, verses 18 and 20. Woe unto you that desire, that long for, according to a dictionary of the Greek, uh, Hebrew, uh, that long for the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? <laughs> the day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Uh, verse 20, shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? What the prophets were describing is what could rightly be called the day of the Lord's purging and avenging wrath on this earth. We've watched them describe that time when all the nations of the earth will be gathered together against Jerusalem for what has been called the Battle of Armageddon that will take place at the close of the seven-year period of tribulation. The prophet Zechariah also told this dark and foreboding day. Notice his words in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, uh, you don't. You want to be left behind. If you were a Jew, when this day appears and you were in the land, you'd want to be left behind. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. They'll be permitted to remain in the city. According to the prophets, there will be great devastation in the land 
of Judea when this great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. In fact, it will take the return of Jesus Christ to put an end to that. Uh, just as he had done with their faithful forefathers in time past, God will once again be allowing the enemies of the now Loami nation to act as the agents of his punishment against that nation prior to God judging those enemies themselves, according to Scripture. This punishment is none other than the wrath sitting in the final installment of the, of the wrath the nation uh, refusing to make their law failure confession had been promised back in Leviticus chapter 26. The culminating battle to take place in connection with this pouring out of God's wrath is known as the Battle of Armageddon. This will be a battle like no other battle ever fought on planet Earth. It will be a battle of epic proportions according to Scripture. It could rightly be called the grand finale, <laughs> if you want to think of it in those terms. The grand finale where the wrath of God against a Christ-rejecting world is concerned. This is the wrath, once again, that is sitting at the very bottom of Israel's fifth and final bucket of wrath, spelled out in the 70 weeks of years prophecy that Gabriel revealed to Daniel. The battle of Armageddon will simply be, as I said, the culmination, the concluding portion of the seven years remaining in the fifth and final bucket of wrath. Keep in mind what Christ had said concerning this great and terrible day of the Lord. He had warned them of what would be occurring at that time in Luke chapter 21, at that time in Luke chapter 21, verse 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. It won't just be the earth that will be impacted when this day takes place. The prophet Isaiah had proclaimed the same calamity to come in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 13, catch this. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. This will be a time such as never has been on earth, uh, never will be again. Now let's bring it full circle. If you were Jewish by heritage in Paul's day, a Jew from the synagogue in Thessalonica who had come to believe Paul's gospel, uh, in that he had proven Christ's identity by way of your nation's prophets. And then someone came along teaching that the great and terrible day of the Lord's purging and avenging wrath had actually arrived and was sitting right on your doorstep. Would you not have the tendency to be just a bit troubled and shaken in mind? I think that would rattle our cages quite a bit. We can only imagine how rattled the minds of the Jewish believers at Thessalonica had become when hearing this, this teaching. Now add to their troubling thoughts the fact that there were teachers at that time who were also teaching that there is no bodily resurrection from the dead. Uh, you'll recall that Paul wrote his letter back to Thessalonica once again from Corinth. And notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 12 what was being taught by some in the assembly at Corinth while Paul was writing his letter back to Thessalonica. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, Paul had been preaching that very thing, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? There we are. <laughs> okay. Do you now see why Paul included the reality of a, of a bodily resurrection from the dead to the saints in Thessalonica? Some of whom had already begun to believe the day of God's purging and avenging wrath had finally arrived. Let's return to Paul's second letter where he began to clear up some of the what we might call misconception confusion that had been troubling the saints of the assembly there. We'll return to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4 for this. Let no man deceive you by any means. In other words, the day of the Lord's purging and avenging wrath has not arrived. Armageddon is not at your doorstep. No matter what some are saying, Paul was telling them, you are not experiencing the beginnings of this final conflict. You are not experiencing the wrath of God. That's what Paul's telling them. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let's quickly look at that term translated falling away. I know how it's often interpreted and we're told to believe it, but let's take a, a closer look at the term falling away. It's the Greek word apostasia. The word apostasia simply means a departure. We use it, apostasy in the English language, as a departure from truth, and that will indeed be the case. 
in, in the latter days. But it means more than that here because it's linked to something directly. Now, don't immediately think Paul's speaking of the rapture of God's people at this point because that is not the case. Paul's going to explain this particular departure as we continue in the text. The departure spoken of by Paul here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is directly related to the words that immediately follow the expression of falling away first. What did Paul say right after he said a falling away first? He said, and the man of sin be revealed. That man of sin being the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, showing himself that he is God. The word translated revealed is the Greek apokalupto, which means uncovered. The dictionary of the Greek defines apokalupto as to lay open what had previously been veiled or covered up, hidden. In other words, until this uncovering, this revealing of his true identity takes place, the man of sin will have been operating for a time apart from being recognized as the one the Bible identifies as the man of sin, the son of perdition the one we call the Antichrist. No one will have realized the true identity of this person until the falling away, the departure, takes place. While he will have been on the scene as a great world leader, his true identity will not have been exposed, will not be exposed, I should say, until the falling away occurs, as Paul just told us. Now stay with us here. When will his true identity be made known? We know the falling away has to occur first. The departure has to take place for, uh, first, and then he'll be revealed for who he truly is. But when will his true identity be made known? The answer is when the departure Paul talked about at the entrance of this passage takes place, and the man of sin, the son of perdition, takes up residency in the temple and proclaims himself to be God. Put simply, he'll be claiming to be the Messiah, the true Messiah. He'll be claiming to be the God-man that unbelieving Israel, having already rejected Christ's deity and identity, will readily accept at that time. Now reason it through and reason it through carefully. When the true Messiah came, how did he come according to scripture? He came in great power, did he not? Christ came in power. That's what he said. In fact, when Jesus Christ was ministering up on the earth to the nation that rejected him, look at what he told them in Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. And Jesus came and spake to them saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. He didn't exercise the power that he had, but all power had been given to him in heaven and in earth. This is precisely why a falling away must occur before the man of sin can take his place in the temple, claiming to be the true Christ by imitating Christ. Keep in mind that this falling away, not a catching up as we're often taught, where will this catching up of believers... Will there be a catching up of believers? Yes, there will. We call it the rapture. The answer is most definitely there'll be a catching up of believers. But that catching up is not the falling away Paul's talking about here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. The man of sin, the Antichrist, will have to be empowered if he's to pose as, to imitate the God-man, Jesus Christ, who came with all power and authority. Jesus Christ had been given all authority and power, he said. When will that empowerment be given to the man of sin so that he can enter the temple, stake his claim to be God, thus openly manifesting his true identity, the believers of that day, by performing the miraculous, having been empowered? The answer to that question is sitting right here in the text. The answer is when the falling away occurs. <laughs> That's when it will happen. That falling away must occur first, Paul tells us. Only then can the counterfeit Christ be empowered to pose as the true Christ. The next question follows right on the heels of the previous one. When will the son of perdition enter the temple claiming to be the God-man, performing all those lying signs and wonders? According to the book of the Revelation, that will take place midway through the final seven years of Israel's fifth and final bucket of wrath. Let's go to the book of the Revelation to see when it is that Satan, Paul calls him the dragon, will empower the man of sin the Antichrist. Here it is in Revelation chapter 13, beginning with verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. A description of the Antichrist here. And the dragon, Satan, gave him his power. 
Who gave Christ his power? God the Father. And his seat, otherwise translated throne in Scripture, and great authority. So the dragon, Satan, is going to empower the Antichrist, the man of sin, give him his seat, otherwise translated throne in Scripture, and where is the Antichrist going to take up residency? In the temple, claiming that he's God. The beast in that passage is none other than the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one that will take his place in the temple at the midpoint of the tribulation period, claiming to be God. It is the dragon in the above verse, Satan himself, that will give the beast his power. Jumping ahead to verses 4 and 5. And they worship the dragon. They're actually worshiping Satan here. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him. Do you see it? This future impersonator of Christ to continue 40 and 2 months. So when was power given to him? If it was given to him to continue 40 and 2 months, midway through the tribulation period. And he's going to take his place in the temple at that point. In other words, the dragon will empower the beast for the final three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. This is the only way that the man of sin will be able to mimic the true Christ. He must be empowered to sit in the temple and convince people that he is Christ returned. The next question is, will the, why will the dragon empower the beast at the midpoint of the tribulation period and not previous to that time? The answer to that question is because Satan will have to indwell the man of sin in order to empower the Antichrist to perform the miracles that he'll be performing. Return with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And then, after the falling away occurs, after the departure takes place, shall that, shall that wicked, that man of sin, the false Christ, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. Do you see it? With all power and signs and lying wonders. Indwelt by Satan himself, the Antichrist will be able to perform all, si all signs and lying wonders. They will be miraculous events. But the power will not be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their power will come from Satan himself, as he, most scholars agree, indwells the Antichrist at that time. Put simply, when the Antichrist takes his place in the temple, he'll be operating through the empowerment of Satan himself. But in order for that empowerment to take place, the Antichrist will have to be indwelt by Satan. When will that indwelling take place? That indwelling of the Antichrist by Satan himself cannot take place until Satan is cast out of heaven and down to the earth. This is why Paul said there must come a falling away first in order for the man of sin to be revealed as the great imposter that he will be at that time. So we should expect to see Satan's falling from heaven take place simultaneously with the false Christ entering the temple claiming to be Christ and performing all those lying signs and wonders Paul told us will be occurring at that time. So we need to continue in the passage. When will Satan be cast out of heaven, we might ask? Well, the answer to that question lies in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. So let's take a quick look. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, that's Satan, and the dragon fought against his angels, and the dragon, Satan, prevailed not. In other words, Satan's going to be the loser in this conflict. Neither was there, the devil and his angels, place found any more in heaven. Now he's cast down to the earth. Look at verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. This is the falling away, the prophet Isaiah proclaimed in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, which would occur at a future time from Isaiah's standpoint. But notice Isaiah's words, verse, chapter 14, verse 12. How, are, how art thou, what's the word? Caught up or fallen? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, the earth, which did weakest the nations? Now, Isaiah wrote it as, as he was given to see it take place long before it would actually take place. Isaiah's statement was prophetic. It's written in the prophetic perfect. This is the same falling away 
that the Apostle Paul told the saints in Thessalonica would occur prior, would have to occur prior to the son of perdition, the Antichrist, move into the temple. His profession of deity being indwelt uh, and empowered by Satan and his claim to the glory that belongs solely to the rightful king of kings and lord of lords. It will be his entrance into the temple with the claim of being God that will make the man of sin's true identity known to those who refuse to fall for those lying signs and wonders he will be performing after being empowered by the God, little g of this world, um, who've been cast out of heaven. So Satan will have to be cast out of heaven. The falling away Isaiah wrote about will have to take place before the empowerment can take place. And the man of sin can take his place in the temple and, and mimic or counterfeit, uh, pose as the true Christ. Move ahead to verse 12 in uh, Revelation chapter 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, an obvious reference to the angelic beings who refuse to follow Satan in his attempt to be like the Most High God. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Do you see why he indwells the man of sin, the son of perdition, to to imitate God, and to imitate Christ rather, and to sit in that temple doing those lying signs and what? You can now see Satan's motivation for indwelling and empowering the Antichrist midway through the tribulation period. That falling away or forced departure from the stellar heavens taken place. Continuing with verses 13 and 14, And when the dragon, Satan, saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman who brought forth the man-child. Anybody make a guess as to who he's going to be persecuting when, when that day takes place? The woman is a reference to the people of Israel. The, man, the woman's man-child is a reference to Jesus Christ who was of the seed of Abraham, the tribe of Judah, the, the line of David. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Now that doesn't mean that there's going to be an airline in that day named Eagle, or that America is going to send a couple jetliners over there and take them all away, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she has nourished for a time and times and a half a time. Who's doing the math? What's time, times, and a half a time? Three and a half years of the tribulation period from the face of the serpent. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Satan's efforts will be focused against the Jewish people, the Jewish people who will not be willing to accept his agent, the Antichrist, as being their true Messiah. And he'll be operating, Satan will be operating through the, the man of sin that he's indwelt. The realm to which Satan will be, con uh, will be confined after being cast out of heaven is the earthly realm. And it was to Abraham and his seed that God promised the land that had been the former location of God's throne room, according to Scripture. God called it his house, Bethel. So Satan will be bent on claiming that territory for himself. Or you can see the conflict that's been taking place in that land from day one. When, when the Christ impersonator moves into the temple in Jerusalem, Having been indwelt by the dragon, Satan, he will demand that he be worshipped as God. Naturally, he'll want to do away with Jewish people who refuse to fall for his I am God masquerade. Uh, I'm sure many of you recall Christ's words in Matthew chapter 24 where Christ gave his disciples the warning to flee to the mountains when they see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Now, let's, let's move back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and continue with Paul's words to the saints in the assembly there who were being misled into thinking that the day of the Lord's purging and avenging wrath, Armageddon, was at their doorstep. Paul had just told them that there would have to be a falling away first. Satan would have to be cast out of heaven in order to indwell the man of sin, thus empowering the man of sin to impersonate the Lord Jesus Christ and attack the Jewish saints. But they were suffering great persecution. Can you see how they may have been misled and easily misled into thinking, it's here right now. It's here right now. That's what this persecution we're undergoing is all about. What has been keeping that indwelling and that empowerment from occurring, we might ask? Why hasn't occurred already? What's keeping it from occurring? Obviously, that's tied directly to Satan being cast out of heaven. This brings us to verses 5 through 7. So let's keep reading. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? These things wouldn't catch these saints in Thessalonica uh, as though a thief in the night had snuck up on them because Paul had already told them about these things. And now ye know what withholdeth 
that he, the false Christ, might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, what, how are we commonly taught? The rapture, right? The key words in these three short sentences are the words withholdeth, letteth, and let. Why are they key words, someone might ask? Well, they are key words because they are all the very same word in the Greek. And they are directly related to the falling away, the casting of Satan down to the earth, the taken out of the way expression that Paul just used. It's the word kateko. And kateko has nothing whatsoever to do with the ecclesia of God, the church of God, the household of faith, being a force capable of keeping the Antichrist from being manifested on planet earth for who he truly is. The household of faith, even after Paul had drawn his final breath, had not been capable of holding back the emperor Titus, were they, from sacking Jerusalem and destroying the temple in AD 70? And the emperor Titus was certainly not the false Christ that will be coming upon the scene with the indwelling power of Satan. And don't think the Holy Spirit had not been indwelling believers during the days of Paul's ministry, because he had. The household of faith today is not even capable of keeping a political party out of office, no matter which side of the aisle you happen to sit on. Much less is it capable of keeping the Antichrist from making his appearance and his identity known on the earth once he's empowered by Satan to do so. No, withholdeth, let, and letteth are not about the ecclesia of God holding something back. They are about something holding back only in the sense that someone is holding on. And that which is holding on is the reason why there must be a falling away before the Antichrist can be empowered by the indwelling Satan to imitate the true Christ. Let me explain it. Notice the word kateko in the following verses of Scripture. And you can look it up yourself. Every single place it's used in Scripture. It's not about holding something back. It's rather about holding on to something. The first instance is about Jesus Christ when he went into the desert. Here it is in Luke chapter 4, verse 42. And when it was day, he, meaning Jesus Christ, departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and kateko. What did they do? They hold him away. They stayed him. They held on to him that he should not depart from him. That's the word kateko. Letteth, let, withholdeth. Were they keeping Christ away from them or were they holding on to the Lord? Kateko in this passage means holding on to something. It does not mean keeping something away. Let's move on to a second instance. In Luke chapter 8, verse 15, Jesus Christ was talking about the... Uh, the word that had been revealed to men in his day. Watch Christ use the word kateko. Luke 8, 15. But on, that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, hold it away or hold, it on, hold on to it. Which one is it? Keep it. That's the word kateko. And bring forth fruit with patience. Hold on to it. How did the Apostle Paul use the word kateko? Well, let's watch. Here it is in Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were kateko, held away from or held on to? Held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. How about this instance of kateko from Paul? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the very, the very epistle we've been studying. Verse 21, prove all things. Hold it away from you or hold fast. Hold on to it. Hold fast, kateko, that which is good. Hold on to it. Don't keep it from coming around you. Kateko is about, not about keeping the Antichrist from appearing on the earth, folks, as, as we're so often taught, in that the restraining force is the ecclesia of God. Kateko is about restraining in the sense of holding on to something, as is proven by every single instance where the word kateko appears in the word of God. Here's another one of those instances from Paul in Philemon, verse 13. Speaking of his friend Philemon, Paul said, Whom I would have, kateko, kept away from me, uh-uh, retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Is the word restrained or is it retained here? <laughs> Paul wasn't trying to keep Philemon from, from being anywhere near him. Paul's desire was that Philemon not depart him. We'll look at one final example, but understand, you're going to find that at every instance where the Greek kateko is used in Scripture, 
The idea is holding on to something, not holding something back. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Let us kateko, let us hold fast, let us hold on to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now apply what we now know about the word kateko to the reason that Paul was giving to the saints in Thessalonica as to why the great and terrible day of the Lord, God's judgment at Armageddon, was not what they were beginning to experience in the days of their extreme suffering. Here it is in 2 Thessalonians. Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5 through 7. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you all these things, and now ye know what withholdeth. Now you know what is holding on, that he, the false Christ, might be revealed in his time, halfway through the tribulation period. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Satan's working in, from heaven right now, but you can't see who he is or how he's working. Only he who now is holding on, Kateko, will continue to hold on until the one that's holding on be taken out of the way. Do you think Satan wants to let go of the realm of the second heavens when he's cast down to earth? And that's why he's so angry. He knows his time is short. The last thing Satan wants is to be taken out of the way by being cast out of the realm of the heavens and, uh, that he currently occupies and down to the earth. However, that very thing indeed will happen when Michael and his angels do battle with the devil and his angels, and in spite of holding on as they might, Satan will be cast to the ground. And the falling away uh, that Isaiah predicted would take place will indeed take place. Armageddon had not arrived because Satan had not yet been cast out of heaven. The falling away had not occurred because Satan had not been taken out of the way. <laughs> Therefore, the man of sin, the greatest identity thief, to ever be known on this planet, the greatest imposter, had not yet taken up residency in the temple in Jerusalem for this claim to be God. But this is the important part. When Jesus Christ does make his second appearance, he will come in the air, the Bible tells us, and those who have taken God at his word throughout the ages and have died prior to that time, Christ will be bringing back with him at that second appearance, Paul tells us. Those who are alive and remain will be instantaneously transformed and caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus all believers will be delivered from the judgmental wrath of Christ that will be pouring out in, in that day upon this earth and upon all those who are rejecting his rightful position as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, along with believing Israel's right to the land that God's given to that nation that he promised to make of Abram. So... Um, the, God's judgment is coming, and the, the saints in Thessalonica knew it was coming. The, the, the Jewish saints, they knew their, the prophets, the writings of the prophets. They were reading those in their synagogues. They just hadn't believed that Christ was the true Messiah. Uh, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming uh, fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it doesn't say taking vengeance on them that have committed this sin, that sin, and the other sin, and especially that bad, bad, bad sin. It's not about sins. He'll be taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's move to verses 9 and 10 very quickly who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. The saints in Thessalonica had been troubled because they had known that Armageddon would go hand in hand with Christ's second appearance. But where will believers be when God's purging and avenging wrath is poured out upon the Christ rejectors of this world. We will have been caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. How much prior to the display of the Lord's purging and avenging wrath will believers be caught up into the clouds to be with the Lord? We're not told. We're not told. And there's nowhere you can go in Scripture to find it because it isn't sitting there. However, what more comforting words could the saints of Thessalonica have heard? from Paul and Silas and Timothy than those he wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. 
For God hath not appointed us unto, what? Wrath, but to obtain salvation. Deliverance from his wrath to come by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Before the Lord pours out his wrath on this planet, believers are going to be protected. Believers are going to be caught up off of this planet before that wrath is poured out. If you want to say that seven years prior to the wrath, have at it. I certainly hope it is. <laughs> but we're not told. We're simply not told in Scripture. The verse, letteth, let, and let, and the falling away have been interpreted to lead us to believe that we know exactly when it'll be, and it's going to be seven years prior to the tribulation period. We're not told that. I certainly hope it is. But we're not told that in Scripture. We're not given any evidence as to when it would come. Paul thought that day, hoped for that day in his day. So it would come like that. And that's why Paul tells us, watch. He told these saints of Thessalonica, watch. Be ready, watch. So we don't know what time it's going to come, but... It'll come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye we'll be, we'll be changed and caught up together in the air with all those departed loved ones who were in Christ before us. And that would be everybody in God's household of faith is the church of God.